burning. All right, Graham Cox, um, all of you are going to be very happy to have met him. Um, Graham and I go back a couple of years ago when um, the late. Des Fleck, uh, who was consulting up in Sierra Leone, got hold of me and said, Dave, um, so what I want to do, I want to these machines and all the rest of it, but I want to use OptiSurface. And Des was, you know, he used to consume a fair amount of alcohol. And I said, Des, what's OptiSurface? He said, Dave, there's a guy in Aussie that's doing OptiSurface. This stuff's unbelievable. And I said, okay. And it was quite hard to find it. There wasn't a lot on the net. Anyway, bit of research and what have you, and I read, found out that it was a guy by the name of Graham Cox, um, and then what really knocked it on the head a few years before that, Bill McCursey and my own, a bunch of teams, guys went across to Aussie and were fortunate to visit Davco Farming, Dave Cox. I think everybody that's in Sugar can or who heard of Dave Cox or visited his farm. Um, that immediately kind of settled any nerves that I had. That if, if Dave was involved with it and whoever he got in board was would something was going to happen. Um, and when I realised they had the same name working from the same office, I was kind of pretty happy. But anyway, that be a side. Um, Graham will tell us how the whole thing evolved, but that's how we we here uh, today here is is really about four and a half. Five years ago, when OptiSurface was not in its infancy, but starting, and since then there's been a lot of work done, backwards and forwards. Um, Graham's been trying to educate me how to do it, so I've learned a lot, so it's not that hard. And I think it's evolved now. I mean, in the last couple of weeks, he's had some curveballs thrown at him by guys like Brent Griffiths, about bridging in circles and whatever. What I want to say to <laughs> um, I think what, what I'm really happy about is Copy Surface is sitting in the corner there. It's not been taken over by some mighty corporate that just puts it on their price list and forgets about it. It's still alive, it's still being developed continuously, and I just hope Granny never sell it and you just keep going with it because. I believe we just can't allow it to die because the other programs are very good. This one is excellent and we just need to keep going. So what's nice about it, each and every one of you will have a relationship with Graham and be able to phone him up at <laughs> midnight like I do. <laughs> and um, yeah, be able to talk to him. But he's associated hands-on with DAPCO farming, which has got to be one of the most advanced farming organizations in the whole of Australia as far as uh, innovative thought, leveling, crop yield mapping out of combines. The, the DAVCO farming organization is, is something of actually becoming almost a tourist attraction in Aussie. Um, and um, yeah, with that, um, Graham, thank you very much, was very happy to come and talk to us here in Africa. And we will be going throughout the rest of Africa, and then I think you're in Brazil fairly soon. Um, of what reason, I don't know. <laughs> and then obviously throughout the world, but we are the first. We are the first to have Graham present to us. So welcome and thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dave. It's a uh, great introduction. Um, I'm, I'm a bit shocked actually, <laughs> the amount of people that are here. <laughs> when uh, Dave said come over for a workshop, I, think I was hoping that we'd get 20 people along and we'd do a, a deep, an in-depth workshop and um, uh, I think he made it too cheap actually, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, appreciate you uh, taking a couple of days out of your busy schedule to um, to turn up and um, I'll give you all the information 
that I can on this uh, on this concept that we've that we're using, and um, and hopefully you'll you'll see the, the value in it too. Uh, yeah, I want to thank Dave and um, tell him for for organising the venue and the and the everything. You may have noticed that um, on the, the conference uh, flyer that uh, Dave Cox was supposed to speak uh, firstly in the morning. Unfortunately, he had an accident a few weeks ago and um, has had some surgery since and uh, wasn't allowed to fly. Um, so I've had to, had to step up and, and take the uh, first session as well. Uh, I've got a short video on him uh, talking about the office service later on. So that's the best we can do. Apologise for, uh, for that. Uh, I'm just going to start with a bit of a story about Opti uh, sorry, Davco Farming, just to set the picture about how Opti Service came about. Yep. Ah, uh, no, that's fine. I have to pull some images up. So, um, um, I guess. It's a bit of a story about how, how David Cox transformed some, some uh, second-rate cattle land into, into one of the most advanced and productive farms in the world using landforming, uh, laser landforming initially and, and um, now OptiService. Um, I was going to give you a quick Google tour of the, of the farm, but um, it is... Internet's down. So, uh, this is um, just an aerial photograph of the farm and it's, um, it's on the Burdekin River in North Queensland. Um, the farm is, is a 12 kilometres in this direction, it goes up here. It's, the fields are 100 hectare, um, 1 kilometre by 1 kilometre roughly, so there's two rows of them. It's fed by irrigation from the Burdekin River. We're in a relatively dry area so we're fully irrigated, what we call fully irrigated, all fire irrigation. So, um, uh, <clears throat> this was all cow country when, when Dave came home from, um, from college, or came home to, yeah, from college in the 70s. Uh, it was all tree, he bought a D5 days and started clearing trees one at a time. He, um, he at that time, the best landforming you could do was, was do it by eye, with a grade or something, or, or or do it with um, dumpy level and um, and stakes. And Dave told me quite, quite a bit of that still goes on in Africa. In fact, uh, he also mentioned some other <laughs> unique methods involving rifles and um, other things. But uh, he, um, <laughs> around that time, um, a guy in the US, um, uh, Robert Studebaker, invented the laser plane, um, which which Dave thought was a great invention. Put this laser out in the middle of the field, spin it around, and, and put it on a bit of a, on a gradient, and drive around the field with your um, earth moving equipment to to shift soil to follow that laser plane. Um, so uh, Dave was an early adopter of technologies like this, and went over to the US and became a dealer for spectrum precision or laser plane back then. He um, and he used the, one of the main motivations was to use it to develop this farm, but also sell it into the um, area. And um, he was definitely the first in the sugar industry in Australia to use laser uh, grading, probably the first in the world. Um, it was quite early on in the laser grading days. Um, okay, so that was what I just went through. Pre pre nineteen seventies, the dummies and states. Nineteen seventies, the laser point came along, um, and was it was a great um, uh, improvement. In the nineties, um, spectrum um, precision integrated the laser plane GPS. Uh, used the uh, you know five meter type accuracy GPS to give you horizontal position, and used the laser plane to give you the vertical position, and 
that was the first step towards kind of three-dimensional landforming. And it, it, um, it was called Geostar System. And, um, it used the multiplane software that is still used today uh, quite widely, where you basically section up the field into a whole heap of, um, each one of these is basically a, a plane. This is a really complex design, as you can see, someone spent probably days actually coming up with that design to try and minimise the earthworks um, and coming up with the section, section lines there. All of those planes actually meet within um, millimetres, you know, probably 10 or 20 millimetres at the edges. And so it's like a massive, it's like a complex three-dimensional puzzle that, you're trying to, that the designer's trying to solve to match up all these edges. Dramatically reduce the earthworks um, from a single plane, um, but um, Dave wanted to. Um, he still had he had his concept of, of going a step further than this, I guess. But we used this system. Well, Dave used this system effectively to develop the um, home farm. Um, probably shifted in you know, around. Um, Two million cubic meters to to laser grade the whole. Uh, it's about two thousand nine hundred hectares, and um, and it works. The farm works very well. Um, one kilometre long rows, efficient irrigation. Um, we have very um, impermeable subsoils, which help us um, achieve efficiencies over long distances, like long row lengths like this. Um, and if, if you're involved with sugarcane, you'll know that, well, if you're involved with mechanised sugarcane, you'll know that row length is, is critical in terms of determining um, the cost of production. Um, one kilometre is kind of very good, or excellent, I guess. Um, but it, once you get up above you know, 700 metres to 1,000 metres, it's kind of in the ideal uh, row length range. Um, this is a this is um, farm. Uh, sorry, harvesting on the on the North Cape farm. So it's a it's a, a very um, nice functioning farm. <coughs> now, as Dave said, you know, people come from all over the world to uh, to look at. Um, you know, I guess it's it's probably, it, it happened to be the most advanced sugarcane farm in the world um, in terms of. Um, uh, the adoption of new technology and stuff like that. Um, now, one negative thing we did come out of this um, laser grading of the farm is that we have really shallow topsoils and we get into this nasty <coughs> sodium subsoil, high sodium content, and um, doesn't infiltrate water real, um, real well. So, if you start scalping, the topsoil off, you get down to this nasty subsoil and the water just won't infiltrate. You can run water over for three days and you'll, you know, it'll, it'll infiltrate this much. So you can imagine trying to grow a crop in that. The good thing is that gypsum improves it. Um, the better, even better than that is that as crop cycles go on, it, it, it improves itself, it prepares itself to some extent. Um, <clears throat> so this is a yield map. This is actually the first yield map, sugarcane yield map in the world. In 1996, it was um, my PhD, part of my PhD research. And you can see that the red areas here are down below 80 tonnes a hectare. 80, say, say, let's say 70 tonnes a hectare. Whereas our good areas are actually up over, over 200 tonnes a hectare. So there's huge variability in there. Um, we'd love to have the whole field up at 200 tonnes a hectare. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that is one negative consequence of, of landforming that Dave mentioned before as well. Um, and it was one of the motivating factors to develop multi-surface. Okay, so the Oki farm, this is a, this is a new farm that, um, that Dave's developing. <coughs> I'm going to try and show you Google it, but I can't. 
but it's um, it's uh, we'd like to get 5,000 hectares out of the new farm, but there's some tree clearing issues that prevent us. Um, it'd probably be at least 4,000 hectares. The and unlike the, the home farm, this farm will be it's a bit steeper than the than the um, the other farm, and we're looking at irrigating this with drip irrigation and overhead uh, lateral move irrigators. So we don't have the need for the consistency of grades that you might want for um, furrow irrigation. Now, having said that, everyone thinks that furrow irrigation needs a single uniform grade, and that's that's not quite true. Um, and I've, I've got some analysis on that, probably won't get around to showing today, might, might give a chance tomorrow. But, um, so yeah, we're, we're looking at drip irrigation and over, uh, lateral move. So what, what, we, what is critical, but, is getting good surface drainage. And, and we, um, you know, I'll, I'll run through some stuff a bit later about talking about surface drainage, but, um, so, let me try and hold myself here. So this is this is actually the first um, area of oppy surface um, that was was done a number of years ago. Um, we've actually had some we had the wettest spring on record last year and couldn't couldn't actually get um, our irrigation infrastructure in planted and everything. So we're we're a bit behind. But the there's basically thousand hectares of opti surface with landform with with landform with opti surface and we're we're extremely happy with it. And the earthworks are dramatically lower than, than, um, than um, the the uh, previous technology. Okay, so okay, yeah, so so Dave had this concept of why can't we have you know curved surfaces? Why why are we limited to straight line grades? And <clears throat> you could have done it with this system here, but there's still this thinking that you need straight line grades. That's what the model plane software kind of bases its philosophy around. Dave had this concept of going to these curved surfaces. So, and then. In 2000s, the you know, RCK GPS started to get more accurate, and um, um, uh, Trimble brought out fear level at that point, fear level 2, and um, basically now you, you can put any three dimensional surface into the, into the machine and, uh, and get the equipment uh, to, to replicate it. What was missing was, was some software to actually calculate what that, that surface should be. And um, I think, yeah, this, this will be, this will lead into um, a video that, um, that Dave has, has done for us.
for sugarcane uh, farming since 1970. Uh, I did not start growing sugarcane until 1987. Uh, but I became uh, the uh, importer and marketer of laser leveling technology for the sugar industry in Australia in 1979. Uh, I was extremely impressed with laser technology at that stage. Uh, the ability to be able to uh, uh, landform with tolerances of you know, plus or minus five or six millimetres uh, was a great step forward in irrigated agriculture. Uh, but after a decade of uh, capturing those benefits, of course, we get frustrated with some of the shortcomings. And uh, shortcoming with laser technology is that laser light travels in a straight line. And most of the Earth's surface is not straight. It is either a convex or a concave slope. And so I had a dream to how uh, to come up with a software program that we could design a farm with these slight curves uh, to allow the design to more closely follow the natural uh, surface. While it's still achieving the objectives that we want, that is uh, drainage and a general smoothing of the field surface to allow for uh, good speed and efficient farming operations. Uh, another major objective was to minimise the amount of topsoil that needed to be shifted in any landform uh, undertaking. So I came up with a concept and put it to a, uh, a, a US company to develop uh, my concept and that wasn't achieved. I then approached my nephew Graham and explained what I wanted to achieve and uh, asked him would he uh, consider taking it on. He did and after my, my recollection is around nine months Graham rang me in the middle of the night and said yes I've cracked it and he's achieved what I wanted to achieve to be able to have variable slopes in a field but not changing slopes at a, uh, at a hinge. So, whereas later now we have a, the technology allows us to do straight lines, a hinge and another straight line. <coughs> no, we had achieved being able to develop a slight curve. The other thing, instruction that I gave Graham, while I was prepared to vary the slope within a field from if an average grade was, for example, 0.1%, I wanted to be able to let the software allow the grade change to be a margin either side of that average. For example, if the average was 0.1%, I wanted the ability to say to the program, if the land surface either side of it, uh, 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 somewhere else in the field, is as steep as 0.15, allow to be that, that steep. If it's as flat as 0.06 uh, or 7, uh, allow it to be that flat. But just smooth it within those constraints. Uh, on my farm, I shifted around 500 cubic metres per hectare of soil in the levelling process when I did it 20 years ago. If I redesigned my farm now with OptiSurface, we would be shifting less than 200 cubic metres per hectare. It's a big gain, <coughs> but then even more important for us, the amount of the maximum topsoil shift would have been dramatically reduced. And in our soil types, we have very little topsoil, and so removing it uh, decreased yield for five, 10, 15 years, and possibly more. Uh, while I was prepared to accept variable slopes within the one field, uh, I did not particularly want the steepest slope I would accept and the flattest slope that I would accept meeting at a point. So 
I asked Graham to come up with something in the program that would allow us to dictate as the designer over what distance we would let the land change from the maximum to the minimum slope. I must say on most of my land that has been off surface level now, with these varying slopes, to the naked eye, we can hardly pick it. And I would uh, uh, challenge most people to uh, pick the difference between what they thought was lasered and what we've actually officered. I hope you uh, uh, enjoy the program with Graham. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, uh, but I'm sure there's going to be more trips uh, that I will make as well with Graham. Uh, uh, at any time, any of you who are in Australia that may be travelling, please, uh, Daft Def Army is here. We, uh, weather permitting, uh, we will be optic surfing probably six months of the year. Uh, so uh, feel free to uh, uh, communicate uh, through Graham or through our website, send us an email and let us know when you're coming and uh, we'll try and. Uh, uh, give you the opportunity to see your service in action here. Again, apologise uh, that I couldn't be there, uh, but thanks very much for uh, participating in the office service workshop. Okay, so that gives <coughs> so that gives you a bit of an introduction about how our office service came about and how we're using it. Uh, I just want to, I'm going to break kind of every half an hour and just ask for questions. Um, any questions at this point in time? Does, does, any, does everyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> am, am, I, am I speaking too much Australian? <laughs> no, you can understand me, is, the volumes are right on the back there. Okay. No questions. Sure, here's one. Can you give us a specification of the soil variability and, and, and stuff like that on the death code that you are dealing with? Yeah, it's, it's very variable. We, um, it's, a, uh, it's a heavy clay soil, but it's, um, uh, you know, it's a sedimentary type um, uh, flood plain that, that has had a lot of different uh, depositional patterns and um, so we, you know, those, those areas, you know, we can have some areas of the fields that will have great soil for three, four metres, and then we'll have other areas where the topsoil will only be 300 millimetres deep, <clears throat> and that's where we're running the problems if we start cutting the topsoil too much. Well, well, we'll have a yield reduction there anyway, in any case, if we didn't cut soil at all. But when you start cutting the topsoil, it makes it worse. Any other questions? The, and, and, and your new operators, are they taken to Optiserv? Uh, from Laser? Yeah, well, it's, it's easier. Um, you know, this, once they get their head around the setup, stuff like that, it's, it's a lot easier. And don't have to worry about wind and, and dust and things like that. We have had some problems with vertical accuracy at times, which, which has been a bit of a pain. And um, um, fingers crossed, that's behind us. The, the, the GPS equipment is improving yearly. So you know, five years ago, um, ten years ago, you, you couldn't do this with RTK um, GPS. They come, they're coming up with better technology. The, the, we, um, you know, it's, we use the, the Russian satellites as well, the GNSS system, <coughs> to improve the accuracy. So it's um, and going forward, uh, hopefully that, that accuracy will continue to improve. Um, but that has been a, a bit of a, I guess, early adopters um, <coughs> by bear. Okay, now, just to ram home this um, the importance of, of drainage, I'm going to take you through another story. Um, of two farmers, and um, and what what farm improvement made the world a difference to their profits? <coughs> so we've, 
of Joe and Darren. They have a near, nearby farms, separate farms on similar quality soil and topography, and grow similar crops. Um, they had a wet 12 months and were coming into a, into a planting season, and, and um, it was looking like there was going to be another wet year with 100, 100 millimetres of rainfall leading up to planting. Um, Joe's planting, he had a bad start. He planted late by an average of three weeks. Um, he messed up some areas badly getting some machinery involved. The machine was damaged when, he, when it was pulled out of the bog. It cost him money to get it fixed. And he needed to hire some contractor, a contractor to help him finish the plan. Uh, Joe's early season, he had more problems. He had a, um, the crop didn't germinate evenly. Some, some was late um, and some areas didn't even come up at all. Some areas were compacted from the previous wet um, 12 months operating in the field with no wet weather. He put on more fertiliser in, in some areas to, uh, with concerns about leaching and denotification. Uh, weeds broke out in some areas because of the, the weaker crop in some areas. Uh, some fungal and root disease proliferated in, in some wet areas of the field. Waterlogged, spraying the bog. Um, Joe's harvest, can it get any worse? Well, the crops ripened unevenly and late because uh, he blended late. Rains came in during harvest because he was late uh, getting it off. Um, had to get a contract harvester into hell. He lost one field when he had harvested it because of wet weather. Yield was down 20% and quality was down 10%. Just thank you for price reduction. Okay, so that's Joe's story. Now, Darren's story is a bit different. He planted on time with good germination. He applied fertiliser as recommended. He carried out spraying in a timely manner and controlled his weeds. Harvesting went well on time with good crop yields and, and quality. Uh, so he had, a, he had a great run. What was the difference to their bottom line? First, the cost difference. Joe had to spend more money growing the crop. Income difference from crop sales. Uh, Joe had less income because of his slower yield and lower crop quality. Profit difference. Joe actually lost money for the year. Darren had a uh, you know, pretty good year. So, so Joe's, um, so Joe's lying in bed at night. Worrying about going to see the bank manager for, to extend his loan. And Darren's um, dreaming about taking his uh, family on a holiday to the Caribbean or something. So, what was the real difference between these two farms? Was it good luck? Good management? Darren actually taking the time to a previous field service range. So this this is actually a hypothetical story. It's not, not two real farmers, but I just wanted to give an example of, of the the problems that you can have if you haven't sorted out your infield range and you have a you know have a wet year and everything. It's kind of a snowball effect that things can just go wrong. So we, I guess, the philosophy that we have in farming is that good infield range is, is crucial to achieving a highly productive and efficient farming operation. 
Um, if, if you don't have that strong foundation, then you you know you, you can be wasting your time in other areas um, trying to get things right and compensating. Okay, so how can you improve your infield range? Well, before I go on, so optimum surface, optimum surface landforming, you know, there's a number of benefits for doing it. The big, the big area or the, the main market for it really that I see is drainage, but there are other areas uh, like irrigation, obviously efficiency, uniformity, um, uh, erosion control and management. Um, and um, Amir will tell us about some interesting concepts he's got about um, improving uh, uniformity of topsoil that later on this afternoon. So you can use it for other applications, but in this talk I'm just focusing on um, the drainage uh, benefits of it, I guess, and that's, that's, that's our main drive for doing it. Okay, so you can, you can cut ditches all through your field and <coughs> make sure the water is in line in the fields. And I've, I've seen quite a few um, fields in Africa that that is the, the main method of, of improving the surface drainage. Um, uh, you can do some laser drainage to improve it and maybe a bit of both of those. Um, or you can do some optimum surface landform. Obviously that's what we would we think is best. Uh, you can also use raised beds, uh, ridged crops, which improve the micro drainage where the, where the plant root is effectively. But I'll show an example later on. You've got to be careful with actually when you put when you put raised beds into a field, you can actually um, create surface drainage problems because the water will actually pool because it can't flow across the bed, so it pool in the furrow. So. But there, there's, there's some methods, and we're, we're talking about surface drainage here, we're not talking about subsurface drainage, which is a, a different issue. If you've got, um, uh, in, in the US, it's, it's, it's very big, um, putting in, they call it tile, you know, ag pipe under the ground. Um, we, we don't do that in Australia, it's not very common. Um, we focus on surface drainage. Um, possibly because we've got heavy, heavier soils. Maybe the subsurface drainage didn't work. Okay. Uh, so, just one more comment on ditches. We don't have any ditches within our fields on our farm. We um, wouldn't tolerate them. We, um, I guess, the downside of that is that you, if you're doing so lazy grading, you, you actually have to shift more soil potentially to achieve that. But the, the negatives of infield ditches are that you're, you're taking actually area of, of, um, of field out of production to some extent. You're, um, you're you, you've got a maintenance problem with these, these drains in the fields. You've got to take and um, um, harbour weeds and promote weeds through the field. They can damage machinery, travelling through them, get involved in them. Um, and the list goes on. So we don't. We don't have any ditches within our fields, um, and yeah, I guess our previous method was ways of grading. Let's move on a bit. We we use raised beds. Um, we think they're very important to achieve good um, uh, good production of um, of crops in our areas. Okay, so you've seen quite a bit about. We spoke quite a bit about office service landforming, but just to kind of put some words around it, maybe. It is modifying the field topography by cutting and filling to a predetermined three dimensional surface, which is optimised to minimise the earthworks while satisfying the water management goals. So, that's quite similar to any landforming, whether it's laser landforming or um, doing Dundee or whatever, I guess. Um, I guess the, what we're really talking about here is having a three-dimensional surface that follows the topography as closely as possible to, 
satisfies your, um, your water management goals. Does that make sense to everyone? Quite easy. So once, once you move away from single planes that are laser required and you have um, a curved surface, you can, you can hug the natural topography a lot closer. So you have to shift less soil to achieve your, um, your drainage. Sorry, you want to mention Okay. I'm just going to run through some, some terms just to clear it up a bit more, maybe. Um, here's some different methods of modifying the field um, topography. First one, land plane. Uh, we've Got um, um, that is actually just dragging like a blade over the field to smooth out the, the micro um, topography, not actually trying to, to change it to any particular um, design surface. So you're just dragging a blade and flattening things out. No, you know, no survey control on that. Laser leveling. Now, laser leveling. Everyone, everyone says we're going to do some laser leveling. I actually don't like the word leveling because leveling actually means, if you look up the dictionary, it means it's a horizontal, horizontal line. Right? So, and the reason people say laser leveling these days, because this, this is my take on it, when laser grading actually first started in the US, what they were doing was in Arizona, they were doing dead level basins, where they just they, they, um, flatten the field, so it's dead level, zero grade, and then they pour on the irrigation water, and they irrigate that way. Because they're in the desert, they don't need drainage. It doesn't rain. And they might get 20 miles a year or something like that. So, so they they can get away with dead leveling, right? But the term I prefer to use when you're putting a gradient on the field with with a laser is laser gradient, um, and you know. Typical slopes that we're talking about, you know, are in the um, quite quite low slopes, point point oh five percent up to you know one percent, two percent. Once your field starts to get above one or two percent, you generally have enough natural um, slope that it'll, as long as your furrows are in that, that direction, it'll, it'll um, you, you won't have any um, drainage problems. But, um, so an opposite landforming is is basically following a you know three dimensional curved surface.